Because it's personal. And here with me is my co host, Erica. I'm on fire and you can't stop me now. <laughs> of Life Changes Inc. And this is Community Nonprofit Network Podcast, aka CNN, where our motto is Where Your Nonprofit Shines. So, Erica, how are you? <laughs> I, well, you know, after your awesome introductions that just get more brilliant and more uh, festive each episode, I can't help but to have a wonderful day. How are you, Sheila? I am doing well. I am doing well. Now, we have an awesome guest today. Tell us who it is. Well, today with us is, is yes, a very special treat. We have Mr. Salik Sahani of the Muslim Voter Project. He is the senior community organizer, and it is voting season to date this episode, but it is so important because uh, we do have, you know, people who don't know uh, what they don't know until they hear from somebody like Solid. So that's what we're here to spread the news about voting and who can, who should, why they should, um, from someone who's in the voters' rights space. Welcome to the show, Salik. How are you? I'm doing so well. It's so good to be here with y'all today. Good morning. Hope y'all are doing great. <laughs> good morning. Well, I'm, I'm going to ask one question to get us started, and then I'm going to pass the mic to you. So it, it's kind of a combo question. Sure. What is your background and Please uh, transfer that to how you got started with what you call MVP. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Please. So, again, uh, really great to be here with you all. Um, so uh, per my background, so I am the son of Pakistani, uh, Pakistani immigrants. Uh, they came here in 1992 and 1994, respectively. Um, I grew up uh Pretty much in the southeast. I was born in Nashville, Tennessee. Then we moved down to Dalton, Georgia, um, also known as the carpet capital of the world. Fun fact, if y'all didn't know that. Uh, <laughs> I was there for most of my most of my formative years, probably from the time I was about five to about thirteen. And then we moved up to uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, where I lived during high school for most of high school as well. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to continue my studies uh, onto uh, New York City uh, at NYU, um, where I studied uh, education. So I basically had um, I had intentions of becoming a teacher, um, but upon taking um, you know t taking classes, understanding the the history of American education, understanding a lot more about the system and the policy that goes into it. Um, I really understood and started to realize that, hey, the, the change on the micro level, on the student level is, of course, incredibly important. But there's a lot of changes that need to happen um, in this country and that basically this the, the education system in this country is unfortunately a a microcosm of the system as a whole. And so there's a lot of changes that need to happen. Of course, I also understand that as one person, I can't change everything, but I can hopefully try and I can collaborate with, of course, like with wonderful folks like y'all and with, with other leaders and change makers across the world to make that happen. Um, and so through that and then through uh, various experiences and internships and whatnot, I, um, yeah, I, I, I sort of, I sort, sort of working with Georgia Muslim Voter Project sort of actually fell in my lap in a way um, because uh, I was originally slated to go to Ecuador right before the pandemic for the Peace Corps. Um, but then, of course, COVID happened. 
And so um, I was like, well, originally the plan was that right before I was supposed to leave in May of 2020, which seems like forever ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what ended up happening is uh, I was just going to work at work at Georgia MVP for about, you know, four or five months to sort of get a feel of the political and civic engagement space. But then, of course, four months turned into you know, five months to a year to now I've been with this organization for over two and a half years. Um, and, and it's just been an absolutely wonderful experience being here. I have, uh, taken on, taken on projects and programs and, and spoken to people and heard stories that I'm honestly very blessed to hear and have been very blessed to take on. Um, but I'm, I, I do this work because I, I guess as I referenced before, you know, I understand that there's a lot of changes that need to be made within the system. Um, I also understand I'm the son of a doctor as well. So I understand that I've been very fortunate and blessed to, to, you know, to not really have many worries in my life, fr- frankly speaking, you know, um, and the fact of the matter is that the majority of the people in this country have not that, that I have not lived the experience of the majority of the people in this country, right? So I, I'm, I'll be the first to say that although I do this work, um, I, I, I recognize that I should not be speaking on behalf of all of those people, but that doesn't mean that I still can't be an advocate on behalf of all those people. Um, and so one thing I always try to lead with is, is empathy because it's, it's very important to lead with empathy to, to hear and to understand others' stories, um, and only through doing so, then am I then am I able to truly be able to advocate, or at least yeah, at least advocate or or be I guess trusted enough or ha- or have people have confidence within me that I can advocate on behalf of them. Um, but again, I'm very very cognizant of of the blessings that I've been have and the fortunes that I've had. Um, and it's honestly for that for that reason that I do this work as well, because I believe that every person, not just every American, like deserves to have a, a really good quality of life. They deserve to have a quali- high quality education. They deserve to have, um, you know, good, affordable housing to have, you know, a, just to have anything that anyone ever needs, honestly. Um, yeah. On top of that, everyone deserves their rights as well. Yeah. Um and so these are really the things that lead me with my work. Um, and then, yeah, and then at, at Georgia Muslim Voter Project, you know, we are we are a voter registration, uh, voter engagement organization. And so we were we were founded on the premise that, you know, there are over 100,000 Muslims here in the state of Georgia. Um, wow. Yeah, yeah. Which a lot of people do not know. Um and so therefore we recognized in about 2015, 2016, along with the unfortunate fact that there has been so much, um, that there was and unfortunately still continues to be anti-Muslim rhetoric, especially in the aftermath of 9-11, yes. that you know, we need to, we need to build a collective block of, of Muslims here in Georgia. And of course we're a nonpartisan organization. We, but we want to make sure that, that our community is civically engaged and that we demonstrate our collective power. We, we, de- we demonstrate that our community is passionate and not apathetic, contrary to what the narratives might say. Um, so we were founded on that premise. And so to date, um, we have registered over 3000 voters. Um, this year alone, we have a, we have a goal to register 800 voters, which we are very, very close to reaching, which is really awesome. great. Um, on top of that, and you know, since, since 2015, 2016, it's only been about six years, you know, we're still a rel- relatively small organization, but I like to say that we're, we're small, but we're mighty. Um, because awesome. we, have been, we have been growing, um, not only in terms of, of the amount of staff that we have now, but in terms of the amount of programming that we're doing now. Um, I myself have led over, have led and provided over like 30 educational workshops this year. Um, we led our first ever candidate forum earlier this year at the, at a mosque in Gwinnett County. So it was the first, one of the first candidate forums and meet and greets that took place at, uh, at a Muslim religious space, um, in Georgia. So it was pretty historic as well as took place, took place this past May. 
So we're making a lot of strides. Um, it's It's been really, really great to see, and it's been amazing to be a part of. Um, and I'm just really excited to see what the what the future of this organization holds um, and what more. And I've been also very blessed to be in partnership, not only with folks at GMVP, but what's really great about the space that I work in is that there's so many other folks that we work with in coalition, and they're doing such amazing work as well. And so right. um, I've just been, yeah, I've been very blessed to meet all these wonderful people as well. And so I'm very, very optimistic about hopefully where the where the future is headed for Georgia. And um, I think I think Georgia Muslim Voter Project will be a huge part of that as well. Well, you know, you, you first of all, I have to say, <laughs> believe it or not, um, I am a retri- retired truck driver. Um, so, yes, I did know, kind sir, that Dalton is the um, <laughs> carpet com- capital of the world. Because I have pulled many a loads from Shaw and Mohawk, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I I I am I am somewhat uh I'm not going to say like totally shocked that there are so many Muslims here. And the only reason why I say that is because I've done the I've worked with the census twice, once in 2000 and once in 2020, mm-hmm. and I was surprised that there were as many as there were, but then I also kind of heard like, you know, uh, kind of whispers like, they're not going to come talk to you. They're not, you know, for whatever reason, they're not going to, they don't trust, you know, um, like a lot of people don't trust the government. I mean, and that's not just a Muslim, that's not a religious thing, oh, yeah. um, but the cultural, <laughs> you know, they're, black people wouldn't come out and talk to me and in certain neighborhoods, um, you know, the hood. Um, and so but it's glad I'm glad to hear, you know, that we are able to get I don't even know that a hundred thousand is all that are here. But that's, I'm glad that a, we are able to get a truer sense of um just how much they're occupying um, you know, Georgia. The collaborative you mentioned, uh, as we met you through um Caitlin Ball um yeah. of yeah. Cobb Collaborative and that that doggone collaborative is something serious because Irene is how um, Sheila and I met. So everyone sitting here is fruit of, you know, that, of that um, tree. And that, that's awesome. Um, Caitlin was on, as you know, a few weeks ago, um, speaking of voting. Uh, well, let me ask you this. Do you also go into the jails and, and prisons to register voters? We do not. We sort of we mostly focus on on like community based spaces. So a lot of the time when we do voter registration, they're at community events or we'll go to different hotspots across the city. We'll go to maybe perhaps the Beltline or we'll go to different MARTA stations, for example. Um, additionally, you know, um, pretty much every week on Friday, we have what's called a Juma prayer, which is our special Friday prayers at mosques across, across Georgia and of course, of course, uh, across the world. And that's usually when we see the most amount of, um, congregation at, at mosques. And so pretty much every Friday we're at mosques doing voter registration. Um, we've got a couple of events coming up. So doing a lot of flyering for those events, um, at, at the mosques as well. Um, on top of that, you know, we have we have other programs called community conversations in which we meet with community members at the mosques um, and just hear their stories. Um, just really, really hear about, you know, what have, what have their struggles been? What have been what what keeps them optimistic? Um, if they do feel apathetic, why do they feel apathetic? And what are what are the things that we can do or what are the questions that we can answer to sort of address the, the potential apathy that does exist? Um, so things like that, um, on top of that, of course, that the, the other events that we do, of course, we do voter registration as well. So, um, yeah, we, we really just try to, we just try to meet the community where they're at and register the voters where, where they're at at the end of the day. Awesome. Well, let me ask you this. I know in churches, um, as a Christ, uh, follower, as is Sheila, um, a pastor has no problem saying, you know, get your vote, you know, get out there and vote. But they wouldn't actually hold a voter's registration that I know of. Sheila, am I, do you, have I you ever have heard no of idea. them? I, I, no, I have no I'm, idea of right now. 
<laughs> okay. Are are you able, um, Solid? Are you able to go into mosques and ask them uh, and actually register? I mean, obviously not during you know prayer or anything, but um, actually hold um, meetings, registration meetings, come on down and get registered kind of events. Yeah, 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 definitely. We're definitely able to do that. Um, usually if we do, uh, register voters, well, usually we tend to do it outside of the mosque just to, of course, preserve the, the respect of the space and, and everything like that. Okay. Um, and it's also sort of, sort of strategic as well. So you will see because if we just get them, get, get all the congregation while they're heading out. Right, too, right. Yeah. You know? So it, uh, it, it works both ways in that sense, I guess. That's awesome. Okay. Um, what is the, um, can you please, uh, share with us and our listeners what is the vision statement and the mission statement for MVP? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the the, the mission sort of vision of, of Georgia Muslim Voter Project is essentially to to uplift um, and empower um, Muslim and and we we recognize, of course, that the Muslim community is not a monolith. You know that we have Muslims of every every race, every color, every background. So to to empower Muslims. Um, across Georgia to empower and uplift the voices of Muslims across Georgia uh, through voter registration, through voter engagement, through education, and, and through advocacy as well. Awesome. Awesome. Do you have, uh, like, the top three concerns that Muslim voters do have? Can you Honest, share those? Honestly, honestly, I don't. Oh. Um, and, and that's honestly because we're still working um, – as as still like a pretty new organization, we're still working on on connecting with the community and determining where the community's at um, across Georgia. Um, but you know, I can sort of say from what I know so far, at least, is that a lot of our community members, from some of the polling that we've done and that some of our partners have done, at least what we have seen is that a good number of a, a good amount of our community is very concerned about about climate change it seems um wow. concerned about about health care especially of course in the wake and the aftermath of covid of course and right. then also i would say that education is definitely a pretty big issue um because um there are definitely a lot of students and a lot of a lot of families uh, muslim families here in the state of georgia um, awesome. But those, those um, that's just from what I've seen so far. Um, I don't want to give a definitive answer, but this is, yeah, that's just from, from what I've seen so far, at least. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that, that to me is a clear indication that no matter where your belief system is, people are people. And mm -hmm. because climate change is, uh, is like up there in the top three right now with everybody, oh, yeah. um, you know, as is education. So that's awesome to hear. Um, when we spoke last week, you mentioned a trip to Savannah. So mm -hmm. can you please share with us and our listeners why the trip to Savannah even occurred and what was your goal heading down there and what were you able to accomplish? Please. Yeah, yeah, of course. I would love to. So we, of course, um, given that we are sort of an Atlanta area sort of based organization, a lot of our voter and constituent engagement definitely does center around the metro Atlanta areas and the five metro Atlanta counties. But we are, in our name, we are Georgia Muslim Voter Project. We're not Atlanta Muslim Voter Project. And so right. we, you know, we, we try our best and we do our best to engage. And we understand that there are Muslims that do not just live in Atlanta. There are a lot of Muslims that live in Macon and Savannah and Columbus and so on and so forth across Georgia. And so we try our best to to engage with them as well because we understand that we are pretty much the only Muslim voter registration and Muslim civic engagement organization in the state of Georgia. And so um if we're not going to engage them then who will? Right? Right. Um and so you know we went to Savannah with that very purpose to see uh to see and to meet more of our community members out there. Uh, that was honestly the main, main purpose. Um, on top of that, of course, came uh, voter registration, um, which I'd like to say went very, very successfully. Uh, while we were there, yes, and, and while we were there, um, we got the opportunity to, um, to meet with community members at two mosques in Savannah, which was absolutely amazing, and register voters at both of those mosques, which was really great. 
Um, and on top of that, we came away with, uh, like 50 plus voter registrations, which was excellent in just about two days. Wow. Phenomenal. Absolutely amazing. Um, and so we're very, very proud of that. And on top of that, these, what we call expansion chips, um, they're also just great. Um, they're just great bonding moments and great bonding opportunities for members of our team as well. Um, now what, what is an expansion ship? Expound on that, please. Yes, ma'am. So basically an exp- expansion trip is just any opportunity that, um, it could be overnight or it can be a, just a day trip, but any opportunity that takes us basically outside of the metro Atlanta area. So pretty much if it's like, I would say if it's outside of like an hour, hour and a half, we would consider that like an expansion trip. And usually those expansion trips are overnight. So, um, so far this year and actually just within the past couple of months, we've done expansion trips to, uh, Columbus, Savannah and Macon as well. Awesome. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I thought you said expansion ship, ex- expansion <laughs> trip. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So now, and, and you, you, you're telling me something new because I used to also deliver in, uh, to Savannah. I had no clue that there was that much of a Muslim community, a Muslim a presence of Muslims to have not one, but two mosques. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. It was amazing. Yeah. I believe at one of the mosques I saw at least, um, I want to say at least a good 150 people showed up, 150 people showed up for prayer. And then at the other mosque, a good hundred showed up for for prayer at that mosque as well. So wow, really amazing to see. Yeah. Well, I have a question. Seems as though you got a lot going on. How do you avoid burnout? That's a great question. And um, honestly, the way we do it is that um, I'm very fortunate to have a very good, uh, very good supervisor and a really great executive director. And so they really, really emphasize mental health. Um, so they make sure we we have, you know, we have generous time off at our organization. So that definitely helps for sure. Um, and so they, they understand that and, and definitely, you know, we work, we definitely like work weekends sometimes as well. So it can for sure be tough, but I think mental, like the emphasis on mental health is really the biggest, um, way that we're able to avoid burnout. Um, on top of that as well, I will say is that working in what I've learned and realized is that working in the voter registration and voter engagement space is sort of like, um, Sort of like an, an endless like parabola. There's a lot of ebbs and flows to it, and that you'll have some periods where you're just you're pretty much just registering voters. It's like it's pretty chill, honestly. You're going out to different spaces, talking to the community. But then there are times like what's coming up now, where I'm planning, I'm personally planning two candidate forums in DeKalb and Cobb County. On top of that, we are registering voters. We have different phone banking and text banking goals for our get out the vote campaign. We have another campaign for, which is called prayers to the polls where we go, where we um, go to the mosques themselves and basically uh, transport, um, tra- transport Muslim voters who maybe not, may not have access to transportation to the polls right after Friday prayer as well. Awesome. So all these different events. And so we understand that of course, um, you know, we make the most out of the time where where things are a little bit more relaxed. So that way, when it does come time for the grind time, that we're ready to go. Um, but of course, there's still that emphasis on mental health throughout all of it. And what's really great is we have very open and transparent relationships with our supervisors and with the executive director as well, given that it is a small organization. And so I think all those things combined really helps mitigate the, the amount of burnout that does take place. Great. Awesome. Um, you mentioned earlier about uh, that MVP doesn't push one party or another. Mm-hmm. So how do you answer the question when a new, um, you know, potential voter asks, well, who should I go for? How how do you approach that question? Yeah. So usually the, the way I will approach it, I'll, of course, always emphasize again that we don't want to encourage them to vote any particular way. But of course, we still care about the issues, right? And that, that's, that's primarily what we speak to them about and how we 
emphasize the power of one's vote, as I'm sure Caitlin touched on as well, as I'm sure Irene touched on as well. And so that's pretty much it. We just tell them, hey, look, vote for the candidate that you feel will best represent your interests, your community's interests, your family's interests, and who, you know, who aligns most with you on the issues that you care about. So if you really, if there's a candidate out there that, you know, truly believes that, you know, education equity is the number one issue and that's also your number one issue, then, hey, maybe they're the best candidate for you. But I'm not going to be the one to tell you that, you know. I would just let you know that these are the issues out there. We'll provide you with the, the resources and the education to learn more about the candidates on your ballot. Um, but then it's, it's up to you at the end of the day, as it is up to every American to decide um, who they want to vote for and who and which candidates align most with them. Okay. I, I just have a, 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 a statement to say, you know, with me, uh, it was the judges. I didn't know who to vote for concerning judges. And that was a, I, I needed more information. And it was like, if I didn't have, let's say that I didn't have the internet or whatever, I couldn't have looked up concerning about what the judges were about, because that is a big, big issue for me, mm -hmm. uh, especially what my nonprofit is, is about to do. And we need good judges, um, people that are going to judge the way they need to judge. Yeah, uh, does that make sense? <laughs> and, oh yeah, uh, it's it's where I, everybody else would advertise, but it wouldn't be where concerning about the judges, and that that was a big issue for me. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but and I and I, I really appreciate that you brought that up. That you know, for example, the 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 judges as as offices and as candidates don't really get that much attention. Because that's really how it goes all the way down the ballot, too. Not a lot of people know about the importance of the labor commissioner or the insurance and fire safety commissioner. Right. Or, of course, recently the, the public service commissioner, it's no longer on the ballot. And there, there's, you know, some controversy around that. But they don't even understand why the public service commissioner is so important when the public service commissioner, for example, um, essentially works with the energy companies the energy policy that they're putting forth is, you know, sustainable, number one. Number two, to make sure that those energy companies are not ripping you off and ripping all Georgians off, for example. And so that person has a huge influence on how much one is paying for their utilities, you know. And so for for folks and for families that are living paycheck to paycheck, for example, that can have that can mean a huge deal. But unfortunately, the awareness might not be out there that, you know, this person does have a huge amount of influence, for example. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, I have, a, I do have another question. Um, do you go into the high schools and try to get um, kids to, to be partners with you and to, because they got a lot of energy more than I do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking, okay, go into the high schools, get them to start doing things. Just a statement. But uh, have you been going into the high schools or? Uh, OK. <laughs> yes, we, we, go into, we go into some high schools to to register voters. And then also what we were able to do this year, which has been really amazing, is we launched what's called our youth ambassador program. And so um, it's basically for youth between the ages of, of 16 to 22. So we also encourage college students to join us as well. Um, and pretty much what we what we do through that program is this, it's a six month program and we basically just just teach them how to be how to be advocates and how to like uh, and how to be organizers pretty much um, help them understand all the intricacies of organizing, how to um, how and where to, to meet the community where they're at, how to leverage and most and how to leverage their voice as well, because, you know, the youth. Um, right now, they're so passionate about so many different things, but they just don't know where to go or how to, how, how to, how to steer their voices in the right direction, you know, to make the most amount of change. And so we just try to empower them through the program. Um, on top of that, it does come with a little stipend as well, so, you know, to help them out a bit as well. Um, and so, yeah, we, we are through, through the Youth Ambassador Program and through hopefully more future programs. Um, we're hoping to further further empower youth um, in our community and, and across across Georgia as well. Because um, 
you know, the, the, the future generations is, are, are where the change is at, you know, so we, we have to empower them. We have to start empowering them early as well. Now, there are now and, and it may be common sense, but I'm going to ask anyway, mm-hmm. do you target only Muslim youth? Um, so for our, for our youth ambassador program, we do specifically work with Muslim youth, but okay. overall for the, for the youth that we do work with in general, we, we just, we want to work with any, any person, any, um, any youth, honestly, any young person. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The same, same goes with our voter registration as well. Although we are Georgia Muslim voter project. And what I like to say is, you know, we we understand that, that Muslims in Georgia and honestly just across the U.S. across the world, we live in in greater and more diverse communities. And so, you know, if I'm if I'm working to register a Muslim in a certain neighborhood, it's very well that their neighbor might not be Muslim, could be Christian, could be Jewish, could be Buddhist, so on and so forth. Right. Uh, so if I'm working to register register their neighbor, who knows? Maybe the word might get out to the Muslim neighbor at the end of the day, and and they might hear about it too. Um, okay. and we, and we also understand that, you know, we are, we are, you know, at the end of the day, we, we hope that and we believe that we're one big community at the end of the day. So we want to register anyone and everyone. We want to empower everybody's right to vote. Um, it doesn't matter about, again, what background you are, what religion you practice, um, what you follow. We just want to make sure that your voice can be heard as well. How do you, when you came on, uh, started with MVP, did you have to go through some kind of training? Because you said you went to school for education. You didn't mention anything about, you know, uh, politics <laughs> in there. So how did you become so astute in what you're doing? Um, honestly, I, I, I sort of got, I guess I got thrown in the deep end a little bit. So I, sort of just had, to learn, I had to learn on the fly. Um, and, and it's funny, you mentioned the census earlier. So my first original position at Muslim Voter Project was, um, getting, basically getting the census awareness out because it was 2020, I believe, and it's a big census year. And of course, with, um, right then, right then and there, the pandemic happened about right. a month and a half after I joined. Um, so it was a very crucial time. And so, yeah, I sort of just got thrown in the deep end. I did have, uh, there is a little bit of training that we have to do in terms of like, okay, like this is how you fill out the voter, this is how you guide someone to fill out the voter registration forms. Um, these are the specific types of asks that we have, things like that. But in terms of like formal, formal training or formal education about organizing or about politics, I've, I've just sort of learned on the, learned on the fly, kept my ears and eyes open. Asked a lot of questions and had good mentors along the way as well. Awesome. Um, do you, does not, even if not specifically you, but does MVP partner with other nonprofits? Um, like for instance, uh, no matter what the religion or faith or whatever is, but ABC nonprofit is having this candidate come speak. Do you then invite your people? to go over there as well to hear that that candidate speak so that they can maybe ask questions, you know, a town hall or something like that. Oh yeah, most most definitely, most definitely. You know, we at the end of the day we want to encourage civic participation, it doesn't have to be with us. We just want it to we just want folks to be engaged at the end of the day. And so, um if we hear about events uh, and we're really good partners with those folks and we always we have a pretty robust social media at this point, especially on Instagram. So we we put out those events on our social media. We also have a monthly newsletter go that goes out. So we try to put out the, the events on our newsletter as well. Um, so as best as we're able to, um, we spread the word. Also, of course, when we're when we're there in person in the field talking to voters, if there's a particular event that we think is particularly notable and would be especially beneficial for our community members, then we also you know encourage them to to go out there as well. Awesome. Okay, so now um, I know Sheila asked you if you if you go to the high schools. Um, do you an, an interesting demographic, and I'm not even sure if it's if it's big enough to discuss the military, um, because I believe Caitlin had touched on uh, you know working with or getting the military to register or something like that. Do you also 
I, are there Muslims in our military in great numbers to where you have like a campaign just to, uh, you know, speak with them? Honestly, I, we don't have a campaign to, to register, um, vote, voters in the military, not as of yet, but I do believe that there is, there, I, I believe like just like, you know, how there's, um, there's more Muslims in Georgia than people might expect. I'm sure there's more Muslims in the military than, than folks might expect as well. Um, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't have the exact numbers about the, 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 the amount of people, amount of Muslims in the military. Um, uh, but I'm sure it is decently significant. Um, and you know, that is honestly, if, if we do hear and understand that there are significant numbers of Muslims in the military or just significant numbers of unregistered voters in the military, that, hey, that might be a great idea for a campaign for us going forward. There you go. There you go. <laughs> get them. Get them. Um, <laughs> um, do you, okay, so you're in Georgia, Georgia, Georgia Muslim Voters Project. Mm -hmm. um, so that's specific to Georgia, but talk to us about expansion because obviously votes are a 50 state deal, you know, are, 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 are there talks about expanding to neighboring states uh, or other states where it's like a hot spot that you really, really need to be there? As of yet, I mean, there's, if there are talks and that would probably be above my pay grade, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> if there are talks, you know, um, you know, they're probably very, very preliminary. Um, but I do know for a fact that, you know, there are other, there are other coalitions, um, and per perhaps other groups in other states that have sort of looked to us as sort of a model for if they oh, want to establish their own, then they can do that as well. I do know that for a fact. Um, and we've been, you know, very fortunate as well to have really good, really amazing grantees, um, across the states that have helped empower us and help, have helped empower um, other organizations very similar to us. And so I'm sure those grantees are also trying to lead the effort as well to establish similar similar groups and organizations like like most Georgia Muslim Voter Project. Um, but that's honestly as far as I know in terms of expansion. Um, but, you know, it would be really great to see because I know for a fact that like in, in Texas, for example, there is a huge number of Muslims in Michigan. Yes. There are a huge number of Muslims, California as well, um, and just across the states, honestly. And so, um, it's, it, it would be, it would be absolutely incredible to have a Muslim voter project in, in Texas or in, in New Jersey or in Michigan and so on and so forth. It'd be really great. Um, right. But we'll see. <laughs> I, uh, New York. I have another question. Um, the polls, because after this incident with, um, our former president um, concerning in Georgia, um, are Muslims getting involved in working the polls? Have you noticed anything like that? Or um, because That's, I know they need poll workers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mhm, mm mhm. Mm and so that, uh, that is another that is another sort of campaign that we try to advocate on behalf of that. Um, you know, we, we definitely understand as well that and we do poll monitoring ourselves, nonpartisan poll monitoring. So we see how understaffed some of these poll polling locations really are. Um, and it's also incredibly important that at these polling locations, specifically in immigrant heavy areas, that you have, you know, that, that you have poll workers in these, in these areas that are able to speak the languages of their community members as well. That way, because unfortunately, um, you know, most of the communication about the voting process, most of well, most, if not all the ballots, except for, I believe, in DeKalb and Gwinnett County are all in English. And so for our, our voters who don't speak English as a first language or who don't read English as a first language, you know, it's important that we we make it as inclusive as a process process as, as possible. Right. And so. We definitely try to encourage our Muslim and immigrant community members to be out there as poll workers. Um, and not only just because, you know, it's necessary, but because, you know, it's it's just another facet of, of a civic duty in a sense. You know, 
Um, it really is a really, it's a really, really great way to give back to one's community, to uplift one's community and empower their community. And so, um, you know, you know, whenever those opportunities arise and also whenever we're registering voters as well, at the very bottom of the voter registration sheet, there's a, um, that there's a, there's a space where you, where one can indicate if they want to be contacted to be a poll worker. So we encourage folks if we're registering them, and if they feel comfortable to to check yes on that as well, so then they can get contacted to be a poll worker one day as well. Great. Quick question. You mentioned, uh, and, and this is on a nonprofit level, if you can answer it, great. If not, um, don't worry about it. But you mentioned stipends that you're going back to the volunt- um, to the the youth project, uh, the youth, what did you call it? The youth ambassadors? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Okay. And you said that you, you, they get paid a little bit of a stipend. Awesome. Thank you. What kind of grant? And this is why I'm asking. I have applied. I have researched so many grants. One thing they won't pay for, a lot of them will not pay for is anything political, anything to do with voting, anything to do with voting. The ones that, you know, that I've gone through. And you're talking about like hundreds of grants. So what kind of grants are you getting that deal with voting and you're able to pay a stipend? Although I understand that may be piecemealing some grants together, but with your funding overall, where does it come from? If you don't mind sharing. Yeah, of course. So specific to like, for example, our, our youth engagement focused grants, um, some of the grants that we get that 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 help fund those programs for example they come from um like youth focused organizations youth focused philanthropic organizations for example one of our grantees is the youth engagement fund and so they their emphasis is youth engagement and so they really want to empower us to put forth programs like the youth youth ambassador program for example um in terms of overall you know political Political grants, um, a lot of our other grantees as well are also political focused philanthropic organizations as well. And their, their mission and their vision is to empower smaller, more grassroots organizations like Georgia Muslim Voter Project to do the work that we can do in the community so that we can continue engaging with the community and meeting the, meeting the community where the community is at as well. Um, I hope that answered your question. Yes, it, well, it did. And, and we tried to provide resources mm-hmm. for other nonprofits. I mean, that, that's the whole point here is to create a global um, network of nonprofits. And one thing, you know, we get a lot is where can I get a grant while I'm waiting for my 501c3? How can I get funding as a new 501c3 who doesn't have 990s done yet? And yep. I know, um, well, I, I don't know. How old is MVP? Uh, about five and a half years now. Five and a half. Six. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you're actually coming out of not long coming out of that new nonprofit. Oh yeah. Kind of I- like, <laughs> well, what can I do? Stage, which can be a little bit frustrating. And and uh, I've seen I've seen nonprofits. I've heard of nonprofits just like form the nonprofit, leave it. And then say, well, you know, I left it alone for a few years because it was hard for me to get support where Sheila and I were just, you know, full force, full speed ahead going as as fast as, uh, you know, the powers that be (laughs) are pushing us. As long as we have that wind behind our back, we keep moving our feet. Right. That's it. That's it. That's the bottom line of it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, this is where we get to know you a little bit, and I think we've already, I think we know you a lot right now after what you have said to us, but um, this kind of gets interesting. Um, sure. So are you ready to go? I'm ready. Okay, it's called What Would You Do? All huh. right, here we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> if you can change one thing in the world, what would that be? I ask myself that question a lot, um, and the, honestly, the answer changes a ton. Um, man, if I could change one thing, um, I would, and this is like, yeah, I, I would honestly, I would, 
I would change the fact, well, I would sort of tackle poverty, but the sort of baseline of poverty would be that I would have it be so that every family across the, across the world has, um, has, has and earns a livable, a livable wage. Um, and so basically create a system in which that is possible, in which, in which every family is able to live that high quality life. Um, because I believe if we're, if we're able to change that, then I guess sort of like a do- it can sort of be like a domino effect where, so, where certain other problems are also able to then uh, sort of get solved as well. So I guess that that's sort of my my yeah. answer to that is I would just try to ensure that every family, if they're living in, in Pakistan and in China in the U.S., um, in the Dominican Republic, that, that they that they can get what they need at the end of the day. That's a good answer. Good answer. All right, you ready for your next one? (laughs) If money was no object, what would you do? I think I would, um, I would either honestly do what I'm doing right now, um, or I would, um, three things. I would either do what I'm doing right now, or I would be, um, or I would be a, a, a singer slash writer, so I do sing a little bit. Um, or I would um, be like a, a sports podcaster slash writer slash sports personality because I'm a huge sports fan as well. So I would do one of those one of those three things probably. Wow, that is a wide range of. <laughs> 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 oh, okay. Wow. All right. Okay, please tell our listeners, who is your hero and shero? So I would, I would say my, I would, I feel like this is, it's a little bit, I guess, sort of basic. But my 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 hero is honestly um, is honestly Dar- Mar- Dr. Martin Luther King, um, just because wow. just because of of his activism, his advocacy, um, the fact that he I feel like he was really the first, if not, one of the first, if not the first, to really you know really really show up for the other here in the states, um, and I really really look up to that. Um, and, you know, he recognized and he mobilized so many people alongside him with through that same vision um, and people, people of all creeds and all backgrounds. And so I really, really looked up to that and really do look up to that. Um, and in terms of my Shiro, I would honestly have to say my mom is my Shiro. Um, Aww. Because <laughs> uh, she, um, she's just, she's all about service all about service. She leads a life of service. She's been uh, teaching religious education since she was 18 years old. Um, Been volunteering in our community and across across all communities. Now she's part of um, Interfaith Atlanta now as as a volunteer. Um, She's probably doing at one time uh, in one year, she's probably doing at least five or six, five or six different, you know, um, you know, service opportunities or, or service positions. Um, and so I, al- I also look to her and she's sort of been my inspiration as well to, to lead this life of service as well. Um, so my mom is definitely my Shiro. And also, my best friend. yeah, yeah. Uh, I can see that now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And here's our last question or here my, my last question to you. Uh, what would you do if you knew you could not fail? Um, if I knew I could not fail, then, um, man, I think, I, I, I think I would, I mean, I'd run for president. that <laughs> job with those crazy people? No, I know, sorry. <laughs> Something, something along those lines. I try to be in a position of leadership, honestly. Um, but I, I don't like not to, 
be in that position of leadership for like for fame or for authority or anything like that. But but because I know that those positions of authority um, provide avenues to get things done and for that right. for to, to take place. Um, and I wouldn't want to be the type of leader who's um, sort of oligarchic or, you know, anything like that. You know, I, I try to, I would try to be as inclusive and as empathetic and as, as loving as a leader as possible, honestly. Um, so oh. if I couldn't fail, then that, that's, that's what I would do, honestly. I think you would make a great president. Oh, I, thank, I think you would. Thank you. As, so. long, as long as you keep the humble heart of a servant that you have now. But it's something about when you get a little higher and a little higher and a little <laughs> higher that that humbleness just kind of like is left, you know, in the grassroots level of things. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and that that humility, like humility goes a long way. It really yeah. does. I mean, that's honestly what we need from more of our leaders today as well. We need we need humility and empathy, I think. Um, and so so hopefully and I, and I really believe that the future generational leaders can hopefully lead with that as well. Um, although we can also sometimes get a little bit cocky as well. So <laughs> well, that's okay. Your mom will get you and put you exactly. in your place. Exactly. Don't put me in place if I don't. <laughs> so how about you tell us what you do in your spare time for fun away from MVP? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think as I, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm really into sports, right? So, um, I've been playing tennis since I was about 12, 13 years old. So I try to, try to get out onto the court one, one or two times every week. Um, love, love to work out as well. Um, my girlfriend and I, she, she, she works at, I don't know if you, if you all have heard of Orange Theory, but she got me into Orange Theory. And so, uh, me and her and go, me and her go work out together sometimes. Um, also been getting into golf pretty recently. So trying to, trying to work on my golf game as well. Um, I think I mentioned as well that I might be that if, if money was no object, then I might be a writer. And so I do enjoy some fiction writing as well. Um, I've written a couple of like chapters of like some books that I, that I have like one goal that like I want to write a book by the time I'm like 30. I'm 26 awesome. right now. So I, I better get started on that again. <laughs> 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 Otherwise, it's gonna come up before I before I even realize. So um, yeah, I love to write as well. Love to read and write. Um, those are really the things that I love to do um, outside of my work. And then, and of course as well, um, I love my family. Love spending time with my family. Um, I'm also a twin. I have a twin brother. So wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So love to spend time and hang out with him as well. So um, yeah, yeah, all those things. Now, now what, okay, well, what's his name? His name is Shops. And he is, um, he's currently in medical school. He's at PCOM over in Sewanee, um, working his butt off every single day. Um, we're very, very proud of him. Um, but yeah, he is, he is my companion. He's my best friend. Um, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so both of your parents can be proud and saying, yep, yeah, my son took after me. <laughs> you took after your mom and he took after your dad. That is too cool. Says that's what everyone says. Yeah, they say they say I I follow after mom and and Shams follows after dad. Yeah. Oh, that yeah, that is that is really cool. Well, as far as that book, because we we're a no excuses podcast. Okay, we are um, community nonprofit founders, so we have to keep it going. So now all the technology we have. Uh, Sir, there's no excuse not to get that book done when you have people <laughs> getting a book done in what one hour? In one hour. So this is a this is a Christian business coach coming out of me, and you, there's no excuse not to get it done. That just like Nike says, just do it. Let's do it. So yes, you have. I believe. Um, I believe in, there's an app called Speakable, if I'm not mistaken, and I, I think it has a free version. But um, everybody, this this is, look, shh, just between us, don't tell anybody. Everybody is using audio and then having it translate, not translated, converted to written. You go to, look, you get a, a free audio 
um, on mine. What do I use on my phone? I forgot what I use on my phone. But you take that file, you find somebody on Fiverr for like 20 bucks and they type it out for you. Or if you want to go, you know, even higher than that, you can go to Upwork for maybe 50 or 60 bucks. But have somebody type, dude, you will have that done by the weekend. Do you hear me? <laughs> no excuse. No excuse. You. So when we have you on, because like we told Caitlin Ball, we're going to have her on after the elections to see how her efforts panned out. We're going to have you back on to see how MVP fared uh, with the elections and the progress and the number, the final numbers that you got before the elections. And so when we come to the end of that, we're going to ask you again. So what you been up to, Solid? <laughs> so we want to hear, oh, my aunt, my book on Amazon is doing great. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> I know, I know. It'll be a little bit tough with the election grind going on, but I'll, I'll give it my best shot. Well, now, yeah, right. That, like I said, no excuses. Sheila is very big on self care, and that self care means step away. You know, get away, get away, get away. That's Mentally, right. physically, emotionally, psychologically. Oh yeah, yeah. So I'm now, trying to travel at some point as well. That's another thing I love to do. I love to travel as well. So that is, and that's awesome. And and now they are wide open with travel. So go for it. Um, right. Where can our listeners? find you um if you can provide an email address mvp uh if you can provide the website url um if there's a phone number um how can we contact you yeah yeah so um my email at georgia muslim voter project is just my first name salik s-a-l-i-k dot sohani s-o-h-a-n-i at g-a-m-v-p dot o-r-g and then uh, as far as our organization goes, you can learn more about our work, uh, Georgia Muslim Voter Project at G-A-M-V-P dot O-R-G. Um, and then we are also on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. Um, Instagram, I would say, is probably our mo- most robust platform. And on Instagram, our uh, handle is at uh, G-A-M-V-P. So we like to keep things pretty consistent across the board. Um, I believe on Facebook, it's just Georgia Muslim Voter Project. And then on Twitter, it's also at GAMVP. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, it was a true pleasure, kind sir. Um, we, we, I learned a lot. I, I, Sheila, did you learn a lot? Oh, my God. Yes. Yes. Yeah. One thing I yeah. want to want to say concerning, you know, there's a shift in what is happening in the world. COVID started it. Yeah. And there's a shift now because when we're talking about, you know, we've been moving so fast and you're a young man that just, you know, you're, you're old enough to be my son. <laughs> and, you know, we're doing this and doing that and doing this and doing that. And God wants us to, to just stop for a bit and just to realize, first of all, who he is. Second of all, who you are in him. When you do that, we connect, all of us, because all of us, there's only one race. That's the human race. Yep. I'm sorry, I got to put it out there. <laughs> and when we know that there's one race, we just have a plethora of different colors, but there's one race. And when we start connecting, you will have that where everybody will have a, a roof over their head, food to eat. We'll have that yeah. once we realize the truth, because we've been told a lot of lies. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so the truth, I understand about the education, because that's why I didn't go into it like I was supposed to. I was supposed to be a teacher also. I wasn't going in that system. It wasn't mm-hmm. about me. So when we start doing that and start telling the truth, we can have all that. However... We got to start telling the truth. That's it. <laughs> but I wanted to I wanted to say this. Um, I, we usually before we go, I usually do a quote. And um, this quote, I had to actually change it. And um, this quote says this. The world is changed by your example, not by your opinion. That's the quote. 
Say say that again. I'm sorry, I, I was stretching. Say that again. <laughs> okay. The world is changed by your example, not by your opinion. Oh yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I I know I say they're all awesome, but they seem to be getting better and better. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you very much. I <laughs> love that one. Um, so thank you for tuning into the CNN podcast. If you would like to be a guest and speak with us on air, please visit our website at thecnnpodcast.com. Click that Be a Guest tab. Um, if you would like to advertise with the CNN podcast, either get a mention on the podcast and or be listed on our website, please, again, visit our website and click the Advertise tab. And, folks, as always, be awesome and be blessed.